You guys ready? We have a lot to cover today, so I may speak a little bit faster. We may be a couple minutes extra. This was not a message I could split in two. We're, we're working through the journey to the cross. This is a five-week mini-series, and you're like, five weeks is a mini-series? For me, it is, okay? So it's five weeks leading up to uh, the cross, the resurrection on Easter. So uh, the first week was the proclamation of Jesus. Last week was the preaching of Jesus. Um, This week is kind of an addition. It's a latecomer. There was only going to be four weeks, but we're adding this week in. This week is the Passover of Jesus. Next week, we're going to talk about the preparation of Jesus, and we'll talk about prayer, the Garden of Gethsemane, the prayer, and then just really talk about prayer. And I know, ladies, some of you were having discussions about prayer in your James Bible study. Nikki was telling me, I said, oh, that's good. We're going there uh, in a couple weeks. So that's the preparation of Jesus, or excuse me, the uh, yeah, preparation of Jesus. And then on Easter will be the persecution of Jesus. So that's where we're going. So the journey to the cross, again, today is the Passover of Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to learn a lot about Passover and what that means and sacrifices and all that. Um, That reminds me of a true story. There was this um, 80-something-year-old man, and he lived alone. He didn't have a whole lot of family, and he was just a a very humble man. He never really did a whole lot for himself. So he was getting up there in age, and he said, you know what? I've, I've never really had a nice car, and he always dreamt of having a brand new convertible Corvette. So he said, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. So he goes to the dealership, And he just puts all the money right there on the desk, and he says, I want a brand new convertible Corvette. So sure enough, he buys this Corvette. It is like cherry red. He gets in it. He starts it up. I mean, he hears that thing purring, right? American muscle. He pulls, and of course, he got the fast one and all of that. So he pulls onto the highway, and he stomps on it, right? And he is zero to 60 in seconds. And he's like, this feels good. So he creeps up and he hits 70 miles an hour and he's getting more excited and his heart is beating a little faster. He hits 80 miles an hour and he's like, well, I'm this close. I might as well hit 100. So he gets 100 miles an hour and this older man is loving it. I mean, what little gray hair he has left is kind of wafting in the wind in this convertible and then it happens. He looks in the rearview mirror and there are the blue lights of the state trooper. Siren goes on. And for a split second, he thinks, I mean, I'm in a Corvette. I might be able to outrun him. So he just punches it, and he's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? So he lets off. He pulls over, and the officer gets out, and he's watching him in the rearview mirror. And the officer walks up to him, looks at him. He says, sir, I'm going to be super honest with you. It's Friday afternoon. I have the weekend off. My shift ends in 10 minutes. If you can give me an excuse for why you were speeding that I have never heard before, I'll let you go. So the old man is like, well, years ago, my wife, she ran off with a state trooper. And I thought you were bringing her back. Officer looked at him and says, sir, you have a good day. <laughs> he, uh, thankfully, he got passed over on a ticket, didn't he? What? Wow. Tough crowd. Just when I thought I had you. Um, I used to get passed over a lot when I was a kid. Not, not for tickets for speeding, um, but... Like, you remember, like, when you were on the playground, and this is probably early elementary, and you pick two captains, and you line up all of the kids right there, and you're picking teams? You you know that deal, right? I would get passed over a lot in that time. Like, we would get right down to the end, and, and, and there was me, and then there was the kid with the broken leg. And it's kickball. And I would get passed over. Everybody say, aw. I know, right? Seriously. So sometimes there's good Passover. Sometimes it's bad to get passed over. But I will say, and as we're going to look at today, if Jesus Christ is your personal 
Lord and Savior, that you are a true biblical follower of Jesus. One day on that day of judgment, you will be passed over because of the commitment that you made to Christ and what he did for you. Today we're going to many times come back to a key statement. And um, as I do a lot during the week as I'm preparing, just to kind of flesh out my messages and just to kind of see where God's going, I will kind of pitch some ideas to people um, when I see them. Uh, So I did this a few times this week, and I, I got the reaction that I expected to. Now, when I give you this statement, you're probably going to look at it. You may push back against it. You may not fully understand it. You may not fully even agree with it. You may be a little bit confused by it, but hopefully by the end of today, as we dig in more and more and more, it will make sense. Maybe it'll make sense right off the bat. I don't know. But here is our key statement for today. The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. And when I say basis, I don't mean the entire thing because yes, we can say we need to have a relationship with God and that, that, that is in prayer and that is in reading his word and that is following him in obedience. And yes, those are very key component, components in a relationship, but the basis The cornerstone, the foundation of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. Now, I want to ask you something. I want want to ask you guys to bear with me today because we're going to take a look back really at a lot of Old Testament. And we're going to talk a lot about blood. We're going to talk a lot about animal sacrifices. And to us, that's really weird because we don't live in that system, okay? Sorry, is that all right? All right, so we don't live in that system, but to them, this was just normal. To to them, they would see sacrifice and blood all of the time, and so as we talk about this today, I want to ask you not to compare it with our culture or with our system, but we have to continue to kind of look back through the lens of their eyes, because to us, it's, it's going to be really, really weird, because as much as we're going to talk about it. So, Luke chapter 22. Everybody got your Bibles? You can turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to park there for a little bit, and then we're going to make our way over to the book of Exodus. So, Luke chapter 22, I'll kind of set this up as you are uh, turning there. This is Jesus right before the crucifixion. You're going to know this story when we get into it, uh, but this is just days before uh, the crucifixion. Luke chapter 22, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve, And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. 
After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. So obviously, this is what? Called the Last, the last Supper. Now, we've all seen the painting by Leonardo da Vinci, right? The big long table with all of the disciples. Uh, that's not biblically accurate, we don't believe. It probably would have been more like uh, they were sitting in a U-shape. Because that's how they would have done it. And it wasn't a table with chairs. They would have been reclining like down on the ground at this very, very low table. So just to give you a little bit of a different picture. But Jesus, as with every obedient Jew during that time, was preparing for the Passover. Like they were eagerly looking forward to it. And it was, it was pretty much all but required for any male Jew within a 15-mile radius of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover within Jerusalem there. It, was, it was, wasn't required, like you wouldn't go to jail, but it was pretty much expected. Um, if they lived far away from Jerusalem and they weren't able to uh, make the passage all the way there, they would dream of being able to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. They even had a saying, and they would say, next year, next year I'm going to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. It was a really really big deal to them. Um, according, and I'm going to give you a lot of information here, but according to the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, one Passover around the time of Christ, and not necessarily this one, but one of them right around there, they were ready for this, 256,000 lambs slaughtered. Whoa. That's crazy. That's weird. That's different, Right? 256,000 lambs were slaughtered in one day for one Passover. And also, according to ancient writers and theologians, there would be about 10 people per lamb that was sacrificed. Because, and we'll see it here in just a little bit, it was one lamb per family. So about a 10-person family. So if we do some really easy math, we just have to move the decimal point a few times. 256,000 lambs times 10 people is how many people? 2.56 million people approximately in the area of Jerusalem during the time of these yearly Passovers. So that gives us a little bit of a picture of what it looked like when Christ rode into town, Hosanna, Hosanna, that's Palm Sunday, that's next week we celebrate, and, and all of that happens. I mean, when it says the, 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 the streets are full of crowds of people, this is why. Millions of people would make the journey and come into Jerusalem during this time. Um, there was hundreds of priests, again, a little, little gory here, hundreds of priests slaughtering about two lambs per minute. Whoa, that's a lot. But think, if you've got to get through 256,000 lambs in one day, that's a lot of slaughtering. Um, and the, the man, the, 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 the husband or whoever was in charge of the family would take this slaughtered lamb back to the, to the family and they would prepare it and they would cook it to eat this Passover meal. Um, they would have all kinds of different festivities and things going on. One of the things that they did was uh, one of the boys in the family, one of the, the children, would be prompted to ask this question. And the question was really a prompt. It was a, a softball lob. It was a setup. They, they would ask, why are we doing this? What, what is this for? And it was a setup for the father or the elder in the family to tell the story of the first Passover in Exodus that we're going to read here in just a minute. So that's kind of the picture of what's going on in this Jewish Passover. But 
as we look at that through our lens of like, that's just so different than we know, it begs a few questions, okay? We've got to kind of dig down to understand this a little bit better. So here's a few questions that I kind of came up with and wrote down. Number one, what is the significance of the Passover? Like, why is it so significant? Number two kind of goes along with this, where did it come from? And number three, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but a serious question, why did so many poor sheep have to be slaughtered? So we're going to look at those three questions. Um, another true story, I went to Zoo Miami last week, and I was walking around, and they have this new enclosure there. Uh, and I looked in the enclosure, and there was a lion and a sheep inside of the same enclosure. And, and I'm like, okay, I said it last week, I don't know a whole lot about sheep right? But I think I know a little bit more about lions, and I'm pretty sure lions and sheep don't get along real well, right? Am I, am I accurate in assuming that? So I'm standing there wondering, and one of the zookeepers comes by, and I, I said, excuse me, this is, this is fascinating. You've got this enclosure, and there's a lion and a sheep in there. D do they ever not get along? And he's like, well, sometimes, sometimes they don't get along. I said, well, what do you do when they don't get along? And he said, we just get another sheep. <laughs> What's the significance of the Passover? Where did it come from? And why did so many poor sheep have to be slaughtered? Well, to answer these questions, let's look back at the first Passover. So you can leave your place in Luke, turn to Exodus. Exodus, it's real easy to find. You go to the beginning of the Bible, you go Genesis, Exodus, you're there. Awesome. Exodus chapter 12. So remember, the children of Israel, they're in Egypt and this whole thing. Moses is coming. Here we go. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. It said, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be to you for the first month, excuse me, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. What was God doing right there? God was kind of restarting time for them. He, he was giving them, creating this new, new year for them. Verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. There's that thing we just mentioned it a minute ago. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Pause just for a second. So pause for dramatic effect. Realize they select the lamb on the 10th day of the month and they slaughter it on the 14th day of the month. There's a little bit of gap in there in between, right? They were to take this lamb into the family. They were to feed it. They were to take care of it. They were to love it. They were to see how precious it was. And then on the 14th day, they were to kill it. Kind of paints a little bit of a picture. When the children, especially parents, adults, as we are supposed to be continually pouring into and speaking into kids, don't you think their kids would have just, Dad, why are you doing this? Why do you have to kill it? Like, like four days, like we have two dogs, okay? And one dog, Lacey, when she was young, we were going to, um, I called it test drive this puppy for a night, right? Oh, we're just going to, you know, see, we're not going to keep it, you know. We're, we're, you know, we're just going to test drive it for the night just to see. It was an awful experience. Okay, the dog cried all night long. It was awful. We still have the dog now like 13 years later, okay? One night we kept the dog. Imagine spending four or five days with this animal, loving this thing. And the children just crying, Daddy, why? Daddy, why? Why do you have to do this? Here's why. Let me explain to you why. Again, I'm just trying to paint this picture of what is going on here. Verse 7. 
They are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Mmm, yummy, right? Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So again, to kind of paint the picture of what's going on here, remember about 400 years early, there was about 70 people who traveled into Egypt. Remember that was uh, Jacob or Israel coming into Egypt to meet Joseph there. They lived there for 400 years. Things were going well in the beginning. Then this 70 plus uh, family became estimated about 2 million people, a nation living within Egypt. And so the Pharaoh at the time, he didn't really care about God. He didn't really care about uh, the Israelites. So he's like, these people are getting really powerful, really prosperous. We need to do something to suppress them. Otherwise, they may take over our nation, Egypt. And so what does he do? He puts them into slavery and he suppresses them and he holds them down so they can't rise up against them. So they're crying out to God, God, save us. We, we, we want deliverance. Save us. So God sends who? Moses. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Right. That whole thing. So that's what's happening here. Uh, Pharaoh says, yeah, probably not. That's my whole workforce. So what does God do? God sends a bunch of plagues on them to say, let my people go. So he sends nine plagues. You've got frogs and locusts and lice and gnats and blood in the river and all these awful things. And like it looks like he's going to let them go. And it's like, mm, nope, yeah, nope. And he keeps going back. And he says, no, I will not. This is my workforce. No way. Nine plagues, they still don't budge. And God save, saves the worst plague for the last, the death of the firstborn. So this begs another question. Why did it progress so much? Again, frogs, pretty awful. Not a huge fan of frogs. Okay, gnats and flies and locusts and blood in the river and like all their water turned to blood. That one's pretty just awful. Okay, and all of this stuff, why did it have to progress all the way to the death of the firstborn? Seems a little harsh, doesn't it? And, and you could look at this and say, ugh, that's, that, that is harsh. I, I don't think that was necessary. Um, I want to take a little bit of theological creative liberty here. You don't have to turn there. You probably know this verse, but Romans 6.23, it says this. For the wages, the paycheck, the earning, the return on sin is uh, you get a slap on the wrist. Uh, you get a little bit of punishment in this life. The wages of sin is what? Death. When you sin, there is death. That's it. There must be death when there is sin present. Got to finish out this verse, but, so glad for the buts in the Bible, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's God gift, God's gift. Yes, the wages of sin, what you earn for sin is death every single time. And again, you might look at that and say, 
a little bit harsh. If I was God, which that's just a dumb way to start any sentence, okay? But you may say, if I was God, I might not do it like that. God's mean. God's unfair. God's not patient. That's just not right. He's going too far. And then I'm reminded of one of my favorite verses, 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is, what's that word? Oh, so good. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, die, eternal death. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's mean, God's unfair, God's harsh. No, no. God's patient. Does sin require death? Yes. But God is very, very, very patient with us and gives us many, many tries before. In fact, looking here at these plagues, they got nine tries, nine chances before death finally came. You know what? That's a patient, gracious, merciful God. If you ever doubt God's grace and mercy and patience, you can look here, not to mention the other numerous places in Scripture to see God's patience and His grace and His mercy. So I want us to go back to our key statement again and look at that. The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. So why sacrifice an innocent lamb, right? Why blood? Why is blood such a thing? And again, it's, so, it's just so weird to us. Well, what, what do they say, what, what do doctors or science, what do they say about blood? What is blood? Blood is life. Blood is life. In fact, we don't need doctors or science or anything to tell us. We can look in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves. Now, we talked about this word a little bit last week. It's one of those big churchy words. It just means to to make right with God again. But the really easy way to understand it, it's at one meant. To become one again with God. Atonement, at one meant. So, for the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood... That makes atonement for one's life. So blood is a sign of life. But going back to why a lamb. The spilling of that much blood meant what? It meant death. And there was a substitution. That lamb's life for your life. There was a sacrificial system that they were in. Here's a big question. Just think about it for a second. Do you realize how expensive your sin is? Think about that. Do you realize just how expensive your sin is? Ultimately, what did your sin cost? I'm kind of telling the end of the story here, but what did your sin cost? The life of Christ. That's how expensive our sin is. The wages of sin is death. Again, Romans 6, 23. Death every single time for sin. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So why do we downplay sin so much? We do, don't we? We downplay it. Oh, it's okay. Like, I I don't really have a problem with that. Or that's just my one thing, or, yeah, I can't really seem to get control of that, or whatever, and we make these excuses for sin, and we downplay it so much. But look at just this passage that we're looking at. Look at some of the strong words that are used. In verse 6, slaughter. Verse 12, strike down. Again in verse 12, judgment. Verse 13, destructive plague. All of those are a result of sin. And we need to see our sin as a much bigger, more expensive 
deal than we do. Why does all of this stuff have to happen? It's because of sin. But as I was studying this, and I've noticed this before, there's a little bit of an elephant in the room. And I don't know if you've noticed it yet. Maybe you have or have not thought of this before. But here's the elephant in the room. Why do the Israelites have to slaughter the lamb and put the blood on the doorposts and around to save their firstborn sons? Like, why do they have to do it if this is one of the plagues for Egypt? Remember, Moses, let my people go, that whole thing, and, and, and Pharaoh wouldn't do it. Why is it that the Israelites have to do the same thing or their firstborn will die? Why is, have you ever wondered that before? It's kind of an interesting question, is it? I want to give you two reasons. Uh, first, Exodus chapter 12 Verse 23, we didn't read this earlier, but it says, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So why is it that they deserve the same punishment as the Egyptians? Well, I'll give you two reasons. Number one, they rejected God's messenger, Moses. It wasn't in this passage, but if you look back in chapters 5 and 6, remember Moses, he goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, no way, get out of here. Hey, we need to crank up the heat a little bit. And he's like, make them, uh, you know, double their production. They've got to make more bricks. Oh, yeah, and make them get their own straw to make bricks. And they made it so much harder for them. And what did they do? Did they go thank Moses for going to Pharaoh and trying to get him out? No, they griped at Moses right then and there, and they kept rejecting God's messenger, Moses. That was one, but that wasn't the big one. The second reason, the big reason, is because of idolatry. Idolatry. They were putting something before God. And again, we don't see it in this passage, but turn to Joshua chapter 24. In Joshua chapter 24, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And pretty much most everybody has heard this passage, just two verses here. Joshua 24, verse 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in, where? Egypt. And serve the Lord. Whoa. So the children of Israel, God's chosen people, we're worshiping the false gods in Egypt, the Egyptian gods, which there was over 2,000 Egyptian gods. Yep. That's why. Because they had forsaken their first love. They had chosen to put something above God. That's idolatry. That is a sin punishable by the firstborn here. Verse 15, got to finish it out. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Such a good verse right there. So back to our key statement. The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. One more short passage and I want to kind of wrap this up here. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis is super easy to find because you go to the book, first book of the Bible and you go Genesis and you're there. Genesis chapter 22, verse 6. God had promised Abraham a son. And out of this son, he was going to make a nation. Like more people than you could count. Like more than the sands uh, on the seashore. And then God said, okay, so that son that I gave you that I want to make a nation out of, I want to, to take him up to the top of this mountain and I want you to sacrifice him. Kind of a, seems like a bit of a contradiction there. We know the story. But he's obedient. So verse 6, chapter 22, it says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. 
and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. He kind of realized what was going on, didn't he? Isaac. They were going to make a sacrifice. They had the wood. They had to take fire along with them. And there was a knife. But Isaac asked a very, very important question. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? This may be the biggest, most important question that you will ever be asked in your life. Where is the lamb? When you stand, and I say when, not if, not I hope I make it, you will stand before your creator one day. And he's going to ask you a question. And he's not going to ask you about your church attendance. God is not going to ask you about the good deeds that you did. We talked about that last week. He's not going to ask you how many old ladies you helped across the street or how many squirrels you fed. He's not going to ask you how much you gave at church. He's not going to ask you any of those questions. He is going to ask you, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? The most important question you'll ever be asked. And I was thinking about this. And I was thinking how easy it is to say, well, Jesus is the lamb, right? Easter, we're going to celebrate it. I got Jesus, yes, I do. I got Jesus, how about you? You know, Jesus is my homeboy. And we do all of those things. But in your life, where is the lamb? Is there evidence in your life that there is a lamb? That has taken your place. So I was thinking about this. I wrote this down. I believe the actions of our lives. Will speak much louder than the words of our mouths. The actions of our lives. And I am not preaching a works based salvation. Again we covered that last week. I'm not saying you can earn your way into heaven. You cannot do a thing to add to God's grace. But there will be evidence in your life that the lamb is really in your life. I know, ladies, again, you're talking about this in James. Paul talks about it a lot. James talks about it a lot. Where is that evidence in your life? It makes me think of that speech by Martin Luther King, the I have a dream speech. I don't have it memorized, but he says something to the effect of, I have a dream where my four little children will be known not for the color of their skin, but for what? the content of their character, what's really inside. Man looks at the outward appearance or what they say, kind of your showy stuff, but God looks at what? The heart, what's really inside. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb in your life? Show me the lamb in your life. I also think of that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When we stand before God and we present to him our life. And, and it makes this comparison of gold, silver, and precious stones. Is, is that what you're going to give to God? Or are you going to give wood, hay, and stubble? Because he says he's going to take that and he's going to put it in the fire. Wood, hay, and stubble, gone in an instant. Gold, silver, precious stones, it will be refined in the fire. Where is the lamb? The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. I want to close with a really cool observation here. You don't have to turn there, but Genesis chapter 3, you guys know the story. This is the fall of man. Eve takes the forbidden fruit, takes a bite, gives it to Adam. They realize they have sinned. What was the first thing that they realized about themselves? They were naked. So it says they sewed together some fig leaves. I mean, talk about a non-fashion statement, right? So they had these fig leaves that they sewed because they needed to be covered. God comes down to do his walk with them, and they hide from him. 
story goes on. You know the story. They realize God, God curses them and says, Adam, you, you know, you guys have sinned. Adam, you're going to have to work for your food. You're going to have to labor and all this stuff. There's going to be thorns. He pronounces judgment. Eve, you're going to have pain in childbirth and all this stuff. He kicks them out of the garden. But what was the very first thing that God did for them? Do you remember? Didn't he kill an animal and take the skin and cover them up? And I'm, I'm, again, I'm going to take a little bit of theological creative liberty here. I'm going to guess, just because of the side, size of an adult human, I'm just going to say it was one animal per person. And again, we, I'm speculating, it doesn't say this, but I'm going to guess that it was a lamb. So, and, and Pastor Tony tells this really well. Again, he's taking some creative liberty here and I agree with him that when God skinned those animals he probably took that bloody dripping skin and placed it right over top of them what better picture can you think of than that of the blood and the sacrifice of something covering over your sin so Genesis chapter 3 we have probably one animal per person. We forwarded to Exodus chapter 12, the first Passover, and each family was to take a lamb and kill it as the sacrifice. One lamb per family. A little bit of time progresses. God establishes the day of atonement. There's our word again, at one mint. The day of atonement. You may have heard of it as Yom Kippur where the priest was to take one sacrifice for the entire nation and sacrifice it. And then a few weeks ago, we read a verse out of John chapter 1. In John 1, John the Baptist is in the Jordan River, and he's baptizing, doing his thing, and he sees Jesus. And it says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One lamb for the entire world. And that's where the sacrificing ended. One lamb, the entire world, Jesus Christ. The basis of a relationship with God is the blood of an innocent victim. And I think our sin is such... A big deal to God that God had to sacrifice his most prized possession in order for us to understand how big of a deal that it is. Jesus Christ, as we will celebrate in two weeks from today, hung on a cross, shed all of his blood for you and for me, for our sin. Let's pray. God, thank you that you, you have provided a way for us to be passed over. God, that sin brings judgment. There's no way around it. And so often we think we can good enough our way out of it. And we can't. But you knew, God, that that sin was so costly that it required the most expensive thing ever, your son Jesus. God, thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you that so many times in Scripture... It says, while we were in our sin, you died for us. Not when we got our act cleaned up, but when we were in our sin, that's when you offered us a way out. God, I pray for those this morning who do not have a relationship with you, who they could not honestly answer the question of where is the lamb 
Maybe, God, they were relying on other things. God, right now in this moment, would you speak to their hearts? God, help them to realize they need a lamb sacrifice in their life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, and you don't know if you could answer that question, if you were to stand before God right now, where is the lamb? I want to give you an opportunity to start a relationship with God. Right now in this moment, would you just say, God, I trust you. God, I put my full faith in you. God, I turn from my sin and I turn my heart towards you. I trust that your son, Jesus, is the sacrificial lamb for me. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that prayer this morning for the first time, I would love to know about it. I'm not going to call you out or cause any attention, but I just want to celebrate and pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up? Say, I got it today for the first time. I made a relationship with God today. Today I decided to give my life to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the good shepherd that you lay your life down to your sheep. Thank you for the perfect sacrifice, God. Help us to not forget and not just celebrate the resurrection on Easter, but God, that we would celebrate it not just every day of our lives, but with every breath of our lives, that we have something to celebrate that you made a way for us. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be a generous people and to be generous in this world, to love people like you love them, to reach people with your gospel. We love you so much, Lord. We pray all of these things in the awesome, amazing name of Jesus. Amen.